Grand's Modeling Workshop today. Uh, I'm glad that you all could join the meeting. Um, as we get started, this is the federal programs team. Um, I'd like it if all of you would, would say hi in the order that you're on the screen there, just so your name pops up, Mary Lee gets to see your smiling faces. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. I am Beth Booster. I am the ESA Federal Programs Administrator. I am Dottie Hoisman, and I'm actually sitting in the office in Lincoln with Jim and Beth, and I am the Assistant as the Program Administrator and the Title I Director. So welcome. Um, and I also do ESU 3 schools and ESU 19. I'll pass the baton to Julie. Julie, you Sorry, I was trying to um, get Ann the link. So, hi, I'm Julie Otero. I'm the uh, Title III and School Improvement and um, other federal grants. And I work specifically with ESU 13 and 15. I'm Jim Kent. I am Title II. I'm, I don't know if I'm Title IV or not. Um, I'm the ombuds person and, and I work with the issues five, seven, eight, nine, and 18. And I'm Ann Hubble and I was frantically trying to update my computer and get everything <laughs> ready to go. And I think I'm good now, but um, I support title three and I work with issues four and six. I'm Amanda Noonan. I work with uh, school improvement title one para and I support ESU one, two and 16. And our Ann Carmony and Benjamin Zink could not be with us today, but I know they wanted to be very badly. Um, and, <laughs> and for everybody's information, Mike Rockhouse, I just want you to know I am in the building today. Just so just so that you're aware of that. And can they can everybody log in? Um just thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> if you could put your name and your school um in the chat so we have a Kind of a login of who was on the meeting. That'd be great. I like your. Who's that? Okay, so I thought I'd throw this uh, this slide on there since the commissioner says that we're going to dust off our mission statement and all of our strategic plans and all those things. So um, the, the the mission is is live and part of our presentation today. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is hopefully you all know. Um, and we have changed from the three year rotation to a five year rotation for the ESSA monitoring. Uh, so, we'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, we're going to go talk about some things in the monitoring guide checklist and things that you should be doing right now, maybe even if you're not going to be monitored this year. Um, and changes in monitoring because we have to monitor the ESSA program. And we have to monitor the ARP HCY program for those of you that those funds. We'll talk just a little bit about those things at the at the end of the presentation. So the, the other bonus that you guys get is because we had this today instead of yesterday, Beth and, and Dottie will be part of the presentation. And and that, what that really means is that when you ask questions, I have to tell you the truth and not make stuff up as I go. So you get, you'll get a real a better presentation today because of that. <laughs> so as you probably know, NDU is approved to move to a three year or from a three year to a five year cycle. Uh, we are basing the rotation on where you were in your school improvement plan in hopes that that will never be in the same year. You should always be two years after your school improvement visit. Um, and also as part of this, we're no longer doing the, the school-wide peer reviews or going through any of that process. Um, now, as a monitoring, we're not gonna double monitor anything. Um, so we, for this year, we're only gonna go back three years at the most. If you are a school who was monitored last year, we're only gonna do one year's worth of monitoring. Uh, for example, I monitored Norfolk just last year. And so this year we we're only going to monitor one year's worth of stuff because we were just on site last year. If you were a school that was monitored three years ago, we're just going to go back three years. Um, like I said, we're not going to monitor anything twice, but we're going to look at everything that hasn't been monitored so far as far as the ESSA thing go. Um, 
So the process for the new five-year rotation is you do the same thing every year for five for four years, and then you get monitored. Uh, I mean, that, that's basically what it comes down to for all schools. You're going to look at your school ride plan or complete your targeted self-review every year. Um, and then in, in the year that we're calling it year three because we're considering year one to be the year you had your school improvement visit. So all of those of you who are in year three this year will be monitored for all of the, all of the federal programs thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the SRO and the ARP monitoring in just a couple of minutes. So, and the only thing that you have to do in the off years, I guess, is to make sure that, and, and every year, is to make sure you review your school-wide plan. If you revise it, um, if you look at that document, there are some fields that are in red. If you revise any of the things that are in red, you need to send it to NDE. Other than that, you just need to make sure that you are posting that on your school's website every year with the most recent version. Um, so this is the five years monitoring rotation for that we're dealing with here. So if you are in column one, you should be being a monitored on site this year. Don't worry, there's a second page. So if you feel left out, you're on the second page. Um, the ESU, the only thing that's incorrect on this document, as far as I know, and I think it's been corrected on our website, is ESU 8 will actually be monitored this year for um, because they have an RPHCY consortium. So this is the second page. Uh, so you can find your names on there. This, all, like I said, all of this information is up on our um, website. Okay, so when we get to talk about the monitoring guide checklist and monitoring itself, the things that you should be doing now are probably things that you do every year. Uh, make sure that you have your time and efforts completed, that you have all of the years since we were there to visit you the last time ready when we come to visit. Make sure you sign them and date them after the conclusion of each semester. Uh, that's one of the important things that we look at for our programmatic monitoring. Uh, make sure that you have the parent, and, and some of these things are just things that always seem to come up when we do a monitoring visit. So these two parent notifications, please make sure that they are in your handbooks uh, or sent home at the beginning of the year when you do your back to school flyer to people, um, have them on your web page, have them, and they're usually in a board policy somewhere. Um, but these two parent notifications are required. Uh, under Title I. Also, make sure that you had your contacts going, um, that you have those things updated, you're reviewing them manually. Um, I know that most of yours are very much like the samples that NDE has put out for you. Um, when you're using those things, you know, make sure that you take the words draft or whatever that are on the NDE website off of them. Take that watermark off before you even use it as your own. Um, anyone who refuses to sign, just like everything else, make sure you keep the written record of that if you if you can get anything written down. Okay. Um, Another reminder for you, we're going through this right this process right now with schools trying to make sure that all of the pairs are qualified. Um, you need to worry about this every year, not the year that you're mon not just the year that you're monitored. If you're a targeted school and you have no pairs who work with Title I kids or who are paid by Title I funds, it doesn't matter. If you're a targeted school who has pairs who are work with or are funded by Title I, they have to meet the qualifications. Uh, and in the school-wide program, all instruction parents have to meet the programs or meet the requirements. In the last couple of years, we have had some flexibility from the U.S. Department of Ed. They have taken those away since we are now not in a pandemic anymore. Uh, and so we have to have either teachers have to meet the education requirements or they have to meet the pass on assessment requirement. Um, and so this is just a little bit more about the requirements. 
uh, high school diploma or GED is a minimum requirement, and then you have to complete uh, two years of college, 48 semester hours, or pass one of the one of the tests. And these are the only uh, alternative assessments that Andy has right now or has, has the ability to use. The statute says that uh, they have an assessment has to be passed, and all three of these things have an assessment with them. Uh, so we're talking about the, the item for targeted schools, it's only if they get paid with federal funds. And when you take Project Para, there are six assessments within Project Para that you have to pass for the Title I certification. Um, and then just other things, remember for homeless, um, in the grant, you set aside $100 to spend on Homeless funds, if you don't get McKinney-Vento, if you do get McKinney-Vento, then there's a match, but that's taken care of in your grant. Remember that we will be asking for the certificate, valid certificate for someone in your district who has taken the homeless training. Um, by default, NDE considers that person to that has to take that training, the homeless coordinator, NDE considers that <clears throat> superintendent unless you change that, I think you can change it in the UGP or you can contact Ann to change that person's name. Jim, okay. can, can you add, um, what should districts do if they don't spend the $100 on homeless in a fund? Do they carry that over to next year and use that 100? What should they do? You have two choices when you have that $100 um, at the end of the year and you have it left. You can leave it there and carry it over to next year, which automatically will force you to have to amend your application and put that hundred dollars in or if your accounting records support that you can over submit your request for reimbursement by a hundred dollars and in without editing category. the grant you can you can your um you can inflate or over request your title one teacher by a hundred dollars if everything matches up with your accounting records and then we'll clean that hundred dollars off the book I wouldn't tell you that the finance people prefer that option because they don't like dealing with carryover any more than you do. So at the end of the year, when you get ready to submit all of your stuff, if your accounting records are $100 more than what you had in the grant, you can over submit by $100 and clean all of that off the book. Thank you, Jim. I don't know why you did this. <laughs> it's your show, Jim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just reminders about eligibility stuff. Um, to be school-wide, you have to be over 40%. If you are wanting to change from targeted school-wide, the form is due November 1st. So I don't, did we change that to December 1st just for this year or this forever? Year. Okay. But we do make, we will yeah. make exceptions as long if, as they can get their plan together by April 1st. If, if, if you have questions and want to, and it's after November 1st, it's goal of Dottie. You just have to have time to do the rest of the work that goes with that. Um, some of these things are just, remember if you're a targeted program, you're getting permission to serve for kids. You can make it be part of the handbook. You can do the um, implied consent thing where you send the, you send it home and say, if you don't respond, we're gonna assume that you said yes. Uh, this, is, this is a piece and, and Dottie may speak to this a little bit, but if you are on one of the lists, TSI, ATSI, CSI, whatever that is, part of the Title I requirements are that you provide additional assistance to those buildings. Now, I know that for a lot of you, that's one building, but you, we still need you to put some thought into how you're going to address the learning gap that is on, that puts you on that list. Uh, because my understanding is if you don't close that gap, the next time we go to come around and do those identifications you will automatically get put on the really naughty list. <laughs> so just make sure you're aware of that and make sure that you're doing something to try to address those gaps. And hopefully trying to address those gaps isn't hoping that that group of students moves on. Um, one of the stickers sometimes in, as when we talk about the, do the monitoring is the foster care provisions. Um, there are requirements in Title I for foster care and for the best interest determination for the children. Um, I think most of you who have a policy subscription service have that in place in your plan. I know if you use 
KSB um, as your policy service. It's in it's in the transportation policy, which I think is 3011. Um, I'm not sure where it is in all the other ones. I'm more familiar with that one, but it, we, we need to see a copy of that policy and that determination when we do this visit. Uh, if you don't have that and need some samples, we have that. Uh, this is, because it says policy on here, doesn't always mean that it rises to the level of a board policy. It can just be a building policy or procedure that you're using, so it doesn't necessarily have to be adopted by the board but it does have to include all of the uh, requirements that are listed here from, from within the statute. Um, this is another fun one. Um, the statutory language in Title I requires that we work with Head Start. Well, in Nebraska, that's a little bit hit and miss sometimes. I've been to districts that are six miles apart and one of them has a thriving working relationship with Head Start and the other one almost has never seen Head Start in their doors. Um, and these are the kind of the requirements within the law for Title I. This information comes out of the monitoring guide checklist. What we're really asking for people to do is to make sure that every year you're in, if you're not one of the schools that has a thriving working relationship with Head Start, have a communication each year with Head Start that says, yeah, if you have any of our kids in your program, we'll work with you to uh, transition them into our program. And if you get that in writing as an email, that's really great. When I post the link to this, when the link to this PowerPoint gets posted, you'll be able to click that, light, that link and it will take you to the Nebraska Head Start webpage. Um, and on that page, there's a map. And, and Beth is supposed to get in the map too, or in the link, in the chat, sorry. I'll get the right word eventually. Um, and it shows a map of who you contact uh, for your local school district. Uh, if you notice, when you, if you open that map, there's a lot of gray on the map that is not affiliated with the Head Start. And we're working through that process. So if you have questions, uh, I hate to say contact us, but contact us and we'll try to steer you in the right direction or you can contact the people on the Head Start page too. Um, parent family engagement, something you should be doing every year, but make sure that you're collecting these documents as you go through the year. Uh, you have to have a policy. Each building can have their own policy. That, you know, in Omaha, each building has, does something distinct. In a, in a district that doesn't have more than one elementary school, they're generally the same policy. We like it if the policy says school and district policy at the top, not just district policy. Still has to meet all of the same requirements. So most of the time they're exactly the same. Uh, annual parent meeting requirement is in those policies. And uh, we will ask you to see those policies when we come to the monitoring visit. So the required each year also is that you have an annual meeting. Uh, I think that's generally separate from the parent meeting. Uh, it, I shouldn't say, there's, there's two meetings, I think, every year. One of them is, is the parent meeting where you talk to your parent about the Title I program and tell all, all the wonderful things that you're going to do with their children to them. The second one is the annual meeting, um, and that's when you revise and review your policy. And I, I think those are distinct events in, in your year, but you need to keep track of both of those meetings. Uh, when we talk about the parent meeting, these are some of the things to make sure you have on your agenda for your parent meeting. Uh, what we do with Title I is how we assess, we get money from the state, we like to have parents be involved, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and these are additional things that need to be shared and be on the agenda for your uh, parent meeting. When you share the, you know, if you have a paraprofessional, you or they're highly qualified, or they not highly qualified, that's not the right word anymore. They're qualified, and you know, parents have the right to know those qualifications while they pass the test, they have the hours, whatever those things are. Uh, and then review the notices that you send out to parents and those things. Um, make sure you save all of these documents after the meeting each year. Theoretically, you're supposed to keep these documents for seven years for Title I. 
Uh, and so make sure you have those on file. And then after seven years, you can discard of them. But these are just examples of documents that you need to keep. We need to make sure that we have how you invited people to get to the meeting. We need to make sure that we have the sign-in sheet. Um, and, and please don't type that list. Please have people sign it with a pen uh, and make sure that you always have a copy of your parent and family engagement policy. Should that policy change over the course of the five years between our visits, we will only look at the most recent policy. We will not look back at old policies. Um, okay. So just a couple of things on the monitoring guide checklist itself. We're not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, you know, we send you out an email. Some of you have already gotten those emails. Some of you, you will be getting them scheduling the meetings. Uh, we like to have stuff back from you a week or 10 days at least prior to the visit so we can look for any things that are missing. A lot of sometimes people share Google Docs and, I can't, and we don't have permission to open those so we can get the permissions and make sure we can open all of those documents. Um, you know, make sure that in, in the locations where we specify documentation that is accepted, you have that stuff. Um, and if you have something in a bold gray box, it's something we need to have to review. Um, okay, so this is just what happens during the monitoring visit. It just, it's, we're not fiscal monitoring. We are programmatic monitoring. So we just wanna to talk to you about your program how is it working? How are you doing with parent involvement? Uh, all of those things, it, it's just conversational. Uh, depending on what we're going to review, uh, know that you know, your staff, if you're a superintendent, your staff is invited to be there if you want them to be there. I've been to, to monitoring visits when non-public school staff were there, which is always good to have. Um, you can have parents be there. If you, if you have a great working relationship with Head Start, want them to be there. Any of those things are, or any of those people can be involved. Wow. Um, so just kind of let me let the visitor, the monitoring your person know uh, who's going to be there prior to the meeting. Jim, can I just add something there? Yep. Um, I can remember being on in you guys' shoes and sitting in a local district and having a, a Title I monitoring or a fiscal monitoring, or, or sorry, programmatic ESSA monitoring. And we put together the big notebooks <laughs> per buildings and the person would come in and it was like almost silent for a while and they flip through some pages and go, yep, looks good and check something off the list. That is not what we're about anymore. So as you start looking at that monitoring guide checklist and Jim tells you more about what we need to see and take with us, we don't want the big thick notebook. I don't want to take that notebook back because honestly, guys, it's going to come here to the department and be thrown away. We don't need that. That's a waste for your time and, our, and everything. So just be sure to keep that in mind. It's more a conversation. And then if you don't have a certain document, you can send us that document eventually, but don't, don't, don't put everything but the kitchen sink into a notebook and think that we'll find what we need. Let's just talk through it and only provide us what we truly need to take with us and show us the other items. Yeah, I'm really good at um, looking for something in, in, a, in a really large group of files for about three minutes and then just <laughs> saying, I can't find it. Would you tell me where it's at? <laughs> um, and, and so, so, so just know that you may get some of those kinds of questions. We, we're not in a gotcha game. Uh, we just want to, it's just conversational. Something's not there. We'll just ask you to get it to us. Uh, we don't want to do findings with people because as much as we love you all, it just means we get to monitor you again the next year. And so we don't want to go down that road. You don't want to go down that road. Uh, and the only way you really will get a finding probably is if you just ignore our request for information, which I almost, almost never happens, but I would say that it probably has happened at your place. And then, Jim, can I add one more comment? Sorry, I said I was going to be quiet today. You know me. That's why it's coming soon, guys. <laughs> um, just, just so you guys know, because I think it's important to understand the why behind why we do this. It's not because we love coming out to your district, which we do. We do. But it's not because we want to torment you and make you get things for us and that sort of thing. This is required by the federal 
government that we do monitoring and thank goodness they let us change from three to five. So we're only asking to see and only taking what we have to see and have to take. We're not adding things to this document because we feel like, oh, it's nice to see. It's, it's just, it's what's mandated for us to do. Was it last spring? Two, two springs ago, we sat through federal monitoring and it was a week of all day, every day. And then it was another 18 months of us continuing to get them documentation. And then we have ad adapted some of our forms to try to make sure we collect all of the information that they're asking for. But what we ask you to do, you to do is far different than what they ask you to do. Yeah. I, I've noticed on the screen, there were some questions about um, the notification and usually like when we're going to do monitoring visits, letters will go out in December or January, about a month ahead of the visit. I mean, I sent mine the first of December. I know there are, are some of these consultants are just getting to that that point in the process right now. But, but Jim is an overachiever for those of you that know him, so he's ahead of the game. <laughs> no, yeah. I didn't have very many, so it's really easy. <laughs> Next year when I have like 25 of them, it'll, be, it'll take a little longer. Just wanted to also know we've stripped it down to only the requirements. So we've worked really closely with the federal government. That's how we were able to get to the five year. That's how we've changed the school wide um, peer review. Anything that's not required, we've taken away. So we've tried to, <laughs> we're, we want to make things as easy for you and for us. So um, that's why there's been so many changes this year. So. Okay, so as we get to this, I mean, this is the beginning of the asset monitoring guide checklist, and I do not have the whole document here, so you'll, you'll be fortunate on that. When you, when you use the county district number, make sure that you get the whole thing. We only need one for your district. Uh, we don't need, if you're Lincoln and have 19 elementary, we don't need one for all of them. Um, although we will need to see documentation for some. This is the first page of the actual document itself. And the only thing I wanna highlight on this page is in the column that says district ESU response, and then there are comment, that is a comment column. Make sure that you have something in every one of those comment sections that applies to your district. So if you have an NA, you don't have to put anything in there, but you should say yes to everything that applies to your district, and you should have a comment for everything that applies to your district. Um, but when I send mine out, I tell you exactly which pages to fill out and which pages you get to skip over. Uh, and so I don't think the other consultants do that the same way. So hopefully you don't fill out stuff that you don't need to. And there's one of you on this call today is getting beginning a message back from me because you overachieved and filled out a bunch of stuff that you didn't need to. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so I'm starting to help you out with that kind of stuff. Everybody's pointing at themselves right now, Jim. Yeah, was it yeah, me? Exactly. <laughs> no, I know I, I may have talked to him earlier in this deal. Anyway. So the other things that we're going to monitor this year, SR1, 2, and 3, um, because those were on an orig originally on a three-year cycle and because the grant expires after three years, we are going to try to make sure that we monitor all of the schools. If this, some of them were last year. Some of you will be this year. Some of you will be next year. So the, that is all wiped out at the same time that the grant goes away. So there is a, you will, this will be part of the monitoring visit for those of you who have on site. Um, for most of you who are following the original three year schedule that was set up with that. Uh, if you, if we are on site monitoring you this year, uh, it will be part of that. If you were supposed to be on site monitored this year, but you've been put off to, 20, 26, seven or beyond, um, we will try to get you done this year. And so all of this will be part of the communication that we get from you. If we come, if we're coming on site for ESSA, this will be on site. If we're not coming on site for ESSA, we're just gonna ask you to send the stuff to us and we will do a desk review of it. Um, this is the list of schools for 23, 24, we will be ESSER monitored. You will be getting a communication from us um, maybe in the middle of February about what we're asking you to do for this stuff. But basically, it's going to be fill out the form and send it back to us. 
So if you're on that, this list, you're going to get that in about a month. If you're on this list, that's the 2425 list. So you'll be getting that in another year. Um, and, and don't worry because we will contact you and let you know what you need to do. So don't get too worked up about any of it. This is, and when you get this uh, PowerPoint link on the website, this is where you can find the self review form. Once again, this is the cover sheet. Make sure you use the correct county district number. And then, oops, I thought I had the whole thing on here. Uh, so that, that's, that's the ESSER program monitoring stuff. Um, it's nine questions and they're all narrative. And if you don't have a non-public then or, and didn't participate, they didn't participate in ESSER one, then you only have eight questions that you'll have to answer. Um, and then the other thing that we're monitoring this year is ARP HCY. This is also for us, just programmatic monitoring. Um, same thing is that we're gonna follow the original three year schedule. If we're gonna be on site with you and you have our HCY money, uh, we will we will monitor that with our on-site stuff. Otherwise it will be a desk review. This is a list of schools who will be monitored this year. Um, and these are the ones that are, I believe, separate from ESSA monitoring. Uh, you notice ESU 2, 8, and 10 have consortia that will be monitored this year. Those are the schools who participated in those consortia. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so schools that are in those consortia, you don't have to do anything because the ESU will be taking care of that for you. But just know that if you did participate in one of those, the ESU may be asking you for a little bit of information. Um, the difference between fiscal monitoring and programmatic monitoring is we just talked about the uses and how the program worked and whether you follow that set of rules. Fiscal monitoring talks about the money. And, and they're the ones who will give you findings that take back your money at the end of things. And we're the nice ones, and they are the, I won't say bad ones, but less nice than us. <laughs> so if you're on this list, you will be getting a, an email that says, um, you know, fill out this RPHCY monitoring uh, document for us. If we're going to be on site this year, it will be part of the review and you will fill it out for that visit. We'll talk about it during that visit. Whoops, got to go back. Oh, how far did I go? Okay, so this is the 24 25 list. It's, this is the 22 23 list for schools who will be done, or 23 24 that will be done this year. These are the schools that will be done next year. Next year, we also have the ESU-3 and the ESU-7 consortia that will be monitored. I would say that for ESUs, uh, we'll be in touch with you, especially the ones who are supposed to be monitored this year to make sure that with your consortia situation, that is something that is appropriate to be done at this time. Um, so if we don't get a hold of you, you can get a hold of your consultant and we can talk through that process. Um, this is a link on the website to that page, and then this is what it starts out looking like. And I guess that is the end of the presentation. There is a contact information for everybody who works with this stuff. And uh, I know you guys have answered, asked questions in the chat, but if you have any right now that you'd like to ask, Beth and Dottie would be happy to answer them. <laughs> And I have put links in the chat to our contact information um, where you can find the monitoring checklists and the schedules, um, where you can find the, the parent policy samples, the time and effort samples. So um, look through the chat. There's lots of links in that chat that I've been adding that um, you might be able to click on and, and help. They're all on our federal programs website, but I know it's not the easiest to find everything. We try to make it as simple as possible. So in the next day or two, we'll try to get make sure we have this um, the, the actual slides on the on the website, and then we are recording this. We will it'll Rhonda will be able to post it on the website after the closed captioning stuff comes through. Uh, so 
No, but it will eventually be posted. As it can be Okay, yeah, the ESSER, the completed needs updates. Um, that first year we did a pilot and we had reviewed, I think it was one per issue and or one per yeah, issue area. And when we got monitored, we found that there were a few more questions we had to ask. So when it says completed needs updated, we're gonna have you redo that on the new form so many of the questions are similar. So if you look at what you sent in that first year, it, it should be similar, but there are a couple other questions. So just complete that checklist and, and that would be a desk monitor. So. Yeah, there were two things that happened. One of them was we had the schools who were pilot schools, and then we had the overachievers who sent out their um, lists, their information early and use the old document and we had to update the document and so some schools filled out the wrong document because consultants sent them the wrong document so or the older document but that was only there's was, only like there a couple are, of questions are, that need so it wouldn't yeah. be filling out the entire yeah. document again it's just two questions that you'd have to change give us answers to it went from so seven questions short. to nine questions so hopefully it's not a, a huge deal yep um, what was the last question? Um, it, yes, uh, the checklists are usually sent to the superintendents. So the consultant will contact the superintendent to line up the monitoring visits and send all the checklists and what pages need to be completed. We have enough trouble keeping track of the superintendents without trying to keep track of everybody. <laughs> we try to say, please forward to everyone that needs it. So um, all, all of the information is, is on our website. You know, who's going to be monitored this year, who's going to be monitored next year, or, and then all of the checklists and forms. And I, 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 I know that all the information is not out there yet because yesterday I got calls from schools thinking that they were going to be monitored this year, but have been postponed to 27, 28. And I told them, don't worry, it won't be me. I'll be retired by then. <laughs> but anyway. Important information, and I think it's been a little bit confusing and maybe not got to the right people. So if you listen to this today and, you know, send that out to your Title I teacher, your building principal, if you're a superintendent or a district person, send it on so everybody knows where you stand and what that looks like. Because with the change, it's a good change, but nonetheless, it is a change. So people need to know how to prepare. We had 120 people at one point on this. So that's almost half of, if that's one per school, that's almost half of the people in this. So there's a question in the chat from Megan, and I think Dottie just kind of answered it, but yes, the checklists are usually sent to the superintendents, yeah. Yeah. but they can share them with anyone on the team who would also be a part of this process. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll get this posted in a couple of days on our website as soon as we get the closed captioning and all that stuff in there. We'll stay on for a few more minutes if anybody has any questions. So feel free to unmute and, and we can talk.